Let your anointing of today change tomorrow. Let your anointing of today change tomorrow. In the year 2015, around about this time, I shared a message and gave four principles of how to move into a new era. I want to just give it to you in a nutshell, the four principles very quickly, and see if you do the number. Principle number one said, in order to go to a new era, into a greater era, number one, don't hold on to past failures or success. How many of you still remember that? I said, don't hold on to past failures or successes. Number two, I said, visualize greater things than your past. That means eradicate small thinking. Begin to visualize greater things. Number three, I said, God is working on your behalf, but most of all, God is working on your faith on the impossible. You have heard so much about grace, answer the voice of faith. You have heard so much about understanding grace and how grace taps in. And you've been taught principle, principle, points upon points of how you've seen proofs of grace tapping in. And then, of course, principle number four said, get ready to receive things you never asked for. Get ready to receive things you never asked for. I wonder if you should remember those four points. But my next question, I wonder if you apply those four points. Because receiving teachings from a school and not applying it does not make a bright student. Buying surf and omo from a shop called super called pick and pay and going home and not using it doesn't make a bright clothing. Buying toothpaste and taking it home and not using it does not make your teeth glow. Buying meat and keeping it in the fridge and going out and say, I have no food to eat, does not get you full. In the church of God, many people receive principle but not apply because we have become comfortable in receiving principles to hearsay but never do say. We never want to apply. This morning, I want to challenge you. I'm going to give you some principles to, to understand because I'm going to talk about let your anointing today change tomorrow. So let's deal with Mark. Let's deal with what uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 says. They had a challenge. The challenge in Israel was that the altars were ruined. The altars were messed. Altar talks about the part, the position they were with God. The place they were placed in God. They had God at the center focus of the life, but suddenly it was a mess. I'm not talking to you, amen. I'm talking to the person next to you. I know you don't do that, amen. Because things were fine. In other words, you came, you received healing. And you went out. You received your blessing. You went out. You received the call for a new job that you prayed for. And you ran out. And the moment you began to get your salaries, you forgot about God and focused on money. You forgot about God and focused on your healing. Some of you wanted a wonderful marriage. Once you got to marriage, you forget about God, you focus on your spouse. Some of you wanted children. The more you got children, you forget about God, you focus on your children. I just want to share a couple of things. The Bible tells me and reminds me that God designed you in the womb of your mom for his pleasure. Can I say it again? God never designed you to take care of ourselves. God never designed you to take care of your wife. God never designed you to make Absa rich. But God designed you for his pleasure that through him you would make stars greater and Absa greater and Agnes greater and your wife smarter and your husband smarter. In simple language, you'll be applying God's perfect will in whatever he places you. I'm trying again. Many a time we miss the focus. And I told you during the, during the year, I said that when you pray, 
for something. You never have faith in that something, but you have faith in God who can give you the something. In other words, you're in your healing. You can't have faith in your healing. You gotta have faith in for your healing. If you want a job, you don't have faith in your job, you have faith in God who can give you the very important. And therefore, this morning, there's no difference because here comes Jairus. Jairus had a challenge because taking from first of the king, the altar was ruined, which means they missed the point. They missed God's anointing. They missed God's position. They missed what God wanted to do. And result to it, he said, now let's get together and build the altar. Tell them we started to build the altar. You might be out here today and say, hang on, I messed up for 2015. I messed up for 2016. I can tell you today, it's not the end. I don't hear a fat mama singing. The Bible tells me very clearly, until God tells you something, then you can never have another. God never said it's over. The race has just started for many of you, not all of us. That means that God never said it's over, you're out, it's done. No, sir. I am declaring today your day has just started, the race has just started, and you're going to be greater and better in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter how you started today, it's how you're going to finish in Jesus' name. Your 2017 is going to be greater according to the anointing that you have. An anointing might be a little mustard seed, but I can be telling you today a mustard seed in your pocket is a tree for God. A mustard seed in your pocket is a harvest in God's bosom. The little seed, the little word that you might be having within your spirit is a mighty anointing to take you further and to build a greater future in the name of Jesus. It's not how big the bag you carry, it's how much anointing you have within that bag that matters in the name of Jesus. Somebody need to shout hallelujah. You can have a room full of people, not necessarily going to win the battle. The battle is won by people of wisdom, not by the amount of people you have. Amen. 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 And so you find Jairus coming all of a sudden, and he had a problem. What is his problem? His problem was his daughter was sick. If there's anything, this daddy knew his daughter was going to die. Why? Because the reality is he's a synagogue ruler. He shouldn't be coming to Jesus. It's not his right. But he decided what? It was a last resort. It was the last of the whole son. He comes to Jesus and he, look at what he does. He goes on his knees. Number one, he should be coming to Jesus. Number two, they don't go down on their knees for a Jew. And he looked at him and says, my daughter is dying. And yet number three, he begged. Number one, he should be coming to Jesus. Number two, Yeah, they're nothing. Number three, they never begged to Jesus. But all of a sudden, when he came in, he said, My daughter is dying. Please, won't you come and heal her? Now, that's very carefully. I don't know about you, but it was me. I would have grabbed Jesus' hand and said, Let's go. I'll pull him to my house. But notice what happened. As he begins to walk, Jesus was disturbed. He was disturbed by a woman who had an issue. And as if nothing happened, he turned around. He began to delay time. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was earnestly urgent for Jesus to heal my daughter, and Jesus was messing around, I would have shaken him with a call and said, what's up? <laughs> Come on, my daughter is sick. What are you wasting your time with this young lady here? You can sort out later. Come on, help me somebody. You act like you won't do that. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't even care if a Ferrari hits your daughter, you, somebody else, you know, leave, leave them alone. The Ferrari is fine, let's go. Amen. Because why? Every person is interested in their own wealth. Yeah. But notice this man called Jairus. He was just walking with Jesus. And Jesus was disturbed by the woman of the issue. Then he turned around to look what is the problem. He's now having a conversation with the disciples. Jesus, don't you know my daughter is dying? And you have a conversation with your disciples? Come on, give me a break. These elders need to go out. You come on, help me. No, he waited. And all of a sudden, he speaks to the woman. He says, don't worry, you know, you're going to be fine. 
And then as if nothing happened, he's going out and now he's disturbed by somebody saying, don't disturb the master, send him away. For your daughter is now dead. I wonder how you can preserve your anointing to change you tomorrow. Let me ask you another question and reverse it. I wonder why our anointing does not break through for tomorrow. Can I ask you that? Sometimes we come to church. We have a wonderful worship service. We have a wonderful breakthrough. We wave our hands. We get laid on. We get slain. We go home. We look at our breakthroughs. Let's deal with that for today. Is that okay? Amen. Am I the right church? Amen. Let's talk about how can we preserve it. Here are a couple of points on how to let our anointing of today change our tomorrow. Follow the pattern of J. Abs. Number one, don't give up on your heart because your future is stored in there and can be disturbed. Our greatest problem in life is that whenever we receive a breakthrough in our heart, we disturb it by the littlest of things and we hinder the flow of our anointing. Look at Jairus. Look at the thing that happened. The greatest challenge of Jairus was Jesus. Not rushing to his home. As a father, his concern was his daughter, but Jesus was disturbed by a woman. And all of a sudden, Jairus was just peaceful. He was focused. What is the way to get ahead? How do you challenge your heart? Your heart will be challenged and say, hang on, I will not let anything disturb my heart. I will not let little things disturb my heart. Why? Because 2017 is greater. Tomorrow is greater. My future is greater. I'm not going to have a, lot, a little thing. My boss cannot disturb me. My spouse cannot disturb me. My children cannot disturb me. The road traffic cannot disturb me. I've got to be focused in order for my heart to have a future blessed in the name of Jesus. Why? Because faith, my brother and my sister, begin from your heart in the name of Jesus. And we don't give up faith intact and strong and faith will be interfered or disturbed because our faith has been hindered in the name of Jesus. I can bring somebody here today you've been praying so hard you've been crying so hard but listen to me you are allowing yourself to be disturbed on little things and God to remind you there's a greater breakthrough God and protect your heart now you can understand when the apostle Paul said put on the breastplate of peace, put on the helmet of salvation, put on the full armor of God. What we say is that protect your heart against any evil or danger so that your blessing will not be interfered in. Amen. Many of us interfere with our blessing because we never protect our hearts. And the easiest way to die, you can be the toughest person, you can be the strongest man. All I'm going to do is pierce you in your heart, you're gone. All you're going to do is have a heart attack, you're gone. You know, there was once a lady who was approached by a genie. You know, it was a genie, eh? And the genie said, I'm going to give you three wishes only. And the three wishes cannot be sinful. In other words, it's not adulterous, not uh, lustful. There's three wishes. So, sure. What do you like? I want you to make my husband the richest in the world. Oh, by the way, none of the wishes will be for you. So I want you to make my husband the richest in the world. Are you sure? Yes. So he became a mighty, mighty, mighty bully that created the Donald Trump. Hmm. Number two, I want you then to give him the weakest heart. And they ask, why? So you can never visit your to me, but he dies, all the money comes to me. <laughs> What am I saying? It doesn't matter how much of wishes and hope you have, but if your heart is not right, your money will be lost to somebody else in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what you do, where you go. I'm going to challenge you today, my brother and my sister. It's time for us to guard our heart, which is the center focus of God's eye. God's will be the apple of his eyes. He would say, but there's a lot of evil going on. Oh, I want to show you a couple of things here. This one. Turn to the book of First, Second Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonica, chapter 1. 
Because sometimes we are concerned about evil people. We're concerned about uh, so many different things. But I can be challenge you today. It's not evil people that stop your blessing. It's you alone that stops your blessing. Because why? God gave us a word. And his word is yes and amen. Are you there first? This is what I come. Chapter 1. Excuse my throat. I just got a slight flu. A sore throat. But you can understand me. Amen. I'm going to read verse 2, verse 2. We always thank God for all of you. Mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, comma, your labor prompted by love, comma, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Most time. For we know, brothers, loved by God, and He has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also the power of the Holy Spirit with deep conviction. Okay? <coughs> Did I say first of all? Sorry, let me go to chapter uh, second, second, sorry, my apologies, second Thessalonica. You're wondering where that is, okay? Let's go to first second Thessalonica. Verse 3. We have always thanked God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. The love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Full stop. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. And that's what it says. You know what it says? It says, therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. That means that you have persecutions, but in the midst of it, you are persevering with faith. Now look at verse 5. All this is evident that God's judgment is right, comma, that as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and can live to you who are troubled to us as well. What is God saying? He's saying, don't worry about evildoers. Don't worry about people that trouble your mind. Don't worry about your uncle Harry in Timbuktu that's trying to get you down. All you're going to do is guard your heart and focus on God and God the charge on your uncle Harry in Timbuktu and let your anointing rise because you protected your heart in the name of Jesus. Because you persevered and persevered and persevered by faith in the name of Jesus and you allowed your mind to be renewed daily on God's word in Jesus' name. God your heart. Somebody shout, God my heart. <laughs> Look at them as a neighbor, neighbor, God your heart. It's a neighbor, God your heart. What did God say? It's time for you to guard your heart. Protect it. You drive on the road. That 90 year old mama is going to come with a VW Beagle in front of your BMW and slam a brake. What are you going to do? Swear that? No! God your heart. Well, whatever the metro, he's going to ask me for some money. Hey, he's a cool guy. Guard your heart. What about my spouse? Guard your heart. No one can understand. A wonderful man of Abraham. He was one to try to cut a covenant with God. And the Bible says, uh, birds of prey came to disturb him. And the Bible says, he changed the birds and focused on God. He guarded his heart. Because why? He knew his tomorrow has to do with what he does today. Your anointing of today will protect you and increase your tomorrow in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. I come to say today, it doesn't matter what position you're right now. It doesn't matter what situation you're right now. It doesn't not matter how you're facing uh, things right now as long as you know that you have a little anointing within you it might be like a mustard seed I'm telling you right now a mustard seed is an opportunity in your pocket to become a harvest for tomorrow in the name of Jesus don't give in don't preach and don't pay somebody shout hallelujah shake that I put you in head in Jesus name number one in simple language you got to learn to guard your heart. Don't give up on your heart. Because your future can be disturbed right there. Number two. Notice Jairus was a Jesus. And he was enjoying the presence of Jesus. Number two says, enjoy your present until the opportunity opens a door. Enjoy your present situation 
until opportunity opens a door. Jesus said to Jairus, enjoy it now. Don't quit with what you have in your presence. Every one of us have a Holy Ghost in us. Every one of us have the Word within us. Every one of us has the love of God around us. World, with the evil, envy, jealousy, hatred come against you. Of course it will. Of course it will. The easiest thing for you and I is you get offended. The easiest thing for you and I is you get upset. The easiest thing for you and I is to think negative. But here's the entire thing. We have a purpose to purpose to grow into positive. To purpose to grow into the things of God. To purpose not to get upset. To grow with God. Every year, folks make resolution with less commitment. We say that the new year is going to be great. We're going to have a breakthrough. And yes, these are positive words. But positive words with no action is like shooting an arrow in the dark hoping to hit something. It doesn't matter how much you can shout and say, I'm going to be blessed. Hey, you can be blessed from now to Timbuktu. You'll never grow until you're actionate in the light of God. Amen. You cannot be speakers. You cannot become declarers without the positive action of God's word. And many of us will become wealthy, but you don't uh, tired. Thank you. Somebody just spoke it for me. Amen. You're going, to become a, a, you're going to become a brilliant child of God, but you don't know where your books are kept. You're going to become a wonderful English student, but you don't read. You're going to become a great student out in British University, but you don't save money. Life doesn't happen that way. Life is not what you purpose it today with anointing you now to declare tomorrow a greater day. You cannot expect tomorrow to show up with a great thing. Please, you need to wash that out that next year is going to be a great year. Tomorrow is going to be a great day. No, sir, it's what you purpose to now will determine your tomorrow greater. Amen. If you step in tomorrow, rude and nasty, I've got bad news for you. You're going to have rude and nasty coming back to you. Amen. But when you step in tomorrow, knowing that you were a failure yesterday, but step in tomorrow and smile a while and walk like you are a millionaire. I've got news for you. People will be asking what has happened to you and you say, God has happened to me. I'm going to tell you right now, my brother, my sister, it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, as long as you purpose in your mind and walk like a millionaire, people will still think you are a mess that brings someone to happen. Begin to start changing the way you are. Well, you never understand, Pastor. I don't have clothing and I don't have a good home. Hey, it's not the size of your house. It's not the branded name of garments. If you have garments, wash it. Iron it. You serve if you have to, not sand. Hallelujah. I tell folks very simple. People, people have a problem with me. They, they're still trying to figure out what color I am. Because I go anywhere, I eat anywhere, I will drink your water, I will drink your tea. Go and ask all my daughters and sons. But there's one thing I never do. I never eat or drink from a dirty cup. I don't care who you are. India or China? No, sir. In other words, I will drink water from your house, from your glass. Not from your tumbler, from your glass. <laughs> Oh, you got that very fast, I say, amen. <laughs> but as long as your glass is clean. When I go to a restaurant, the same thing I do. I was in, I was in the U.S. And, and they gave me breakfast. And they gave me the plate, and I said, the plate chipped. I said, excuse me. Amen. And the looker says, uh, what's, uh, I said, this plate is chipped. And the looker says, so what? I said, I came to a restaurant, I'm paying good money. I can't have a little chipped plate. Because that chip might be on my eggs. And if I ever even decide me, I'm going to die. Please change it. Finish. What am I saying to you? I am saying I'm fussy with neatness and cleanliness. And God is the same because cleanliness is not next to godliness. Cleanliness is godliness. Yeah. And so until we change our thinking, go ahead, give a shout of praise. That's right. Yeah. The year 2017 is not going to be supernatural and blessing. No, sir. What you purpose to do now? 
will change your tomorrow. How you desire your anointing now will change your tomorrow. Your 2017 is about double grace. Double grace means that what you promise you now, you will receive double from God because you have overcome sin in your life in the name of Jesus. You are a wonderful husband to your wife. You are a wonderful wife to your husband. You begin with children. You are not the heart of honor the law. You knew how to respect the teacher. And when you begin to do all these things, God will honor you. Don't forget, SARS is your biggest problem. Amen. 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 Well, I thought the police were. No, sir. The police is on our side. Hello? I said the police is on our side. How you to treat them is how you receive it. Amen. So what does God say? I love what he says. He says, God's in Chronicles. He goes to and fro to see who is committed to him in order to strengthen them. He simply says, enjoy the present opportunity of God. Enjoy the presence of God. And the opportunity open the door for you. God is with you. The Holy Ghost is with you. The angels are around you. Heaven is backing you. Your prayer is within you. All you're going to do is step out there and see how opportunity opens up doors for you. Why? Because you are God's son. And I love the Bible says, if God be for us, then who can be against us? No devil, no son, no man can be against you in the name of Jesus. Why? Because you are on the side of God. And the Bible says, opportunity is open. And God will say, now move. And you're going to move in. Why? Because you become obedient to the voice of God. Number one, you will guard your heart so that you never disturb your future. Number two, Enjoy your present situation. Jairus enjoyed the presence of Jesus. I have to ask a question. How come he will enjoy the presence of Jesus? Because he knew no one else can raise up his daughter. No one else can heal his daughter. So even if Jesus took two years to come through, he's not concerned. Why? Because he heard down the line that Jesus took four days to come and raise up Lazarus from the dead. And now he said, hang on, Jesus, if you took four days to raise up Lazarus and you are stinking, 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 and you got him out well, healed, perfumed, how much greater will you do for my daughter? How much greater will you do for my marriage? How much greater will you do for my job? How much greater will you do for my brother? I declare today you will raise up a dead, stinking person in a mighty and wonderful person in the name of Jesus. That is my God. He will do it for you suddenly in Jesus' name. Four weeks ago I was in Western Cape and uh, the pastor asked me a question well before that is this prof, we'd like to have the graduation at a civic center, but the civic center is right opposite a huge informal settlement. Well, you know, coming from Kauteng, you know the informal settlements. I said, go ahead. So obviously behind his mind, he knew there's going to be poor people who's going to attack. And so we had the service that morning. He was shocked. That place was packed. Everyone was there. And so the service began to go on. I finished ministry. I had an altar call, pray for the people. And we never closed the service, but I was about to hang over when an elderly colored sister, now making a point, as I use the word colored sister, she came down slowly. She was a grandmother. And the boy was as as large as real was. So he was about a grade three, grade four. And of course she was kind of guiding him. And I didn't understand why. And she began to speak to the pastor in Afrikaans because she knew I was so anointed. <laughs> I didn't finish. <laughs> okay. Then I couldn't understand well, she was telling me. <laughs> so the pastor whispered in my ears, quite loud, he says, Prof, the grandmom said this boy has to go on Tuesday for an eye operation and they may have to remove his eyes because he cannot see, he cannot see 90% in both the eyes. And he's only grade three, uh, she doesn't know what to do. So now I can understand why she was maneuvering him. 
And so, it's a total order. I said, sure. I looked at the boy and I put my hands on his shoulder. I said, young man, do you understand English? They kind of looked at me because I've been praying for him. I'm asking him a question. I said, very simple, I want you to understand me. Do you believe Jesus can heal you? He said, yes. I said, okay, let's pray. I placed my hands and I prayed. I was at peace because I realized it's not my business. Amen. And so the grandmom looked at me and she grabbed the child and she turned over to back. Well, I got back together, you know, the mic, had my lunch, had the graduation, and off I came. Monday went, I didn't worry about it. Tuesday went, I didn't worry about it. When there's a morning, I received a WhatsApp. Prof, a report on the young boy. There's no operation. His eyes are being restored. The mother in his eyes dropped. And not only that, he's a grade three. So in grade three, you don't receive A aggregate, B aggregates, no. You receive numbers. Everyone knows that. What's the highest number? Seven. Sorry, what again? Seven. Every subject that boy received, seven. 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 Every subject he received seven. And they were amazed. I said, see, God can do a supernatural work. Why? Because that's his business. Why? Because his presence was there. And along with his presence is there, you'll be at peace and know he's taking charge over everything in the name of Jesus. I can be telling you right now, it doesn't matter your situation, it doesn't matter your business, it doesn't matter your job, it doesn't matter what you are facing. As long as you know that the presence of God is there, opportunity will open the door for you in the name of Jesus. Happy in the church. Hallelujah. Number three, number three. Always know that what you enter into will be tougher than your presence. I'll say it again. Always know what you're about to enter is going to be tougher than your presence. It amazes me how sometimes people want a new job. Or suddenly I get married. Or suddenly, well, I want this and that. But this entire thing. When you enter into a marriage, you are courting before you said, I do. Everybody help me. Okay. You are what? Courting is like giving roses without a thorn. <laughs> Amen. And until you gave all the best and got married, do you remember, remind yourself of the rest. That means that there's reality of the marriage. Before marriage, you pull the chair and you'll make your husband so your wife sit. <laughs> Other than ladies say amen, but nobody said amen. But after you marry, you cannot tell her where to sit because she'll excuse me. Because why? When you enter into a marriage, it's tough. Until you work through that marriage, then it becomes easier. Amen. When you enter into a new job, you love the job, you love the salary, but you notice the moment you enter into the job, it is tough. You don't know where the machines are. You don't know what's expected of you. You don't know what to do, etc. But as the days go by, it becomes easier in the name of Jesus. And I know what you're thinking about. Listen to the country. Goliath was destroyed so easily by David. Why? Because David had it tough when he went to the lion. He had to fight hard. He was tough for him. But he destroyed the lion. He fought the, girl, the bear. He destroyed the bear. So when he saw the lion, he said, come on, you're an easy dude. What I'm saying to you. As you walk down the journey of toughness, it becomes easier in the name of Jesus. Your future, it will be tougher than your present. But listen to me. As you persevere and persevere by faith, your future will be easy in the name of Jesus. You won't be a winner. You won't be a champion and you won't be a champion and an overcome a war because your purpose to persevere and take charge because your entry into your enemy will be tougher. Amen. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> and many of us give up the moment we enter. 
you enter, join, enter, enter, enter a wonderful company, and all of a sudden, sudden the company's going to die. What do we do? We want to abandon ship. But God is saying, hang on. Do you know how to persevere in the business? Because no business is going to make you a billionaire overnight. If that business makes you a billionaire overnight, it must be drugs. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everything is tough. Nothing starts off easy. Tell me about it. Nothing starts off easy. That means when there's a marriage, when there's a job, it doesn't matter. It will be tough. But once you start trusting the Holy Spirit, He will make it easier for you in the name of Jesus. What about children? You love to have children until you have them. After that, enough. They cry. And they cry. And they cry. And they cry. And you wonder why. <laughs> it's never going to be easy. Every child does that. Here's my entire thing. I'm amazed. I think you nurses, nurses, any nurses? Probably not you right now. Have you ever seen a nurse after you deliver, she delivered a child? She holds the child upside down and spanks him with the bottom? <laughs> I would like to sue that nurse. <laughs> but then she told me, no, Pastor, I have to do that. I said, what? So I know the child is breathing at least. This is what I'm saying. Life, you never enter easy. Life, you enter to be tough, but you make it easy in the name of Jesus. Any business is going to be tough, you're going to make it easy. Any marriage is going to be tough, you're going to make it easy. In simple language, life becomes easier as you persevere by faith in the name of Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. Well, what about children? You know, uh, don't think so we should already do. Listen to me. If you make life easier for your children, you're not going to allow to see success. Amen. A child that has a little tougher life will be successful later. Amen. Because a child will learn what it is to overcome pain and to become victorious in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've got to know how to allow life to be turned around. How? Becoming tougher, but knowing it will become easier. Because why? Don't worry about easy, worry about success. Tough or easy, success must be your story at the end of the day. In anything, begin to look at success, but never think it's going to be easy overnight. Number one, guard your heart. Tell your neighbor, guard your heart. <laughs> Number two, enjoy your present until the opportunity opens the door. Number three, always know that what you enter into will be tougher than your present in the name of Jesus. Number four. Our present situation is getting us ready for the new era of our lives. Your present situation is getting you ready for the new era of your life. Only a sprinter will understand it takes at least nine seconds to complete 100 meters. But it's nine seconds later he fails to take. In simple language, how he prepares his now will get him to break the tape later. Your present situation of preparation, how you prepared your life, how you prepared your, your finances, how you prepared your courtship, how you prepared your children, how you prepared your education, will prepare you for a new era in the name of Jesus. If you don't study, you prepare yourself for a new era of failure. If you don't save, you prepare yourself a new era of having no money in the future. You cannot come to 2017 and say, well, pastor, you know, you prophesied. Praise God, I don't. Until I've told you. I don't know. Don't expect any season to bless you unless you know how to sow first into the season. A season is the same. I love what you say, December is a month of love. Who told you that? Well, pastor, we give out free food. Big deal. <laughs> Every month should be the month of love. Every day should be the day of grace. Every minute should be the minute of pain. We should be walking as children of God. December is not the month, is not the month of love. Then what is February? Amen. Well, it's Valentine, Pastor. Hallelujah. <laughs> you see, we miss it. That is why most people are broke in January. <laughs> I love when people say, well, it's the third week of the month, Pastor. So what? It's a broke week. No wonder you're so broke every third week. 
There is no broke month. There is no broke day. I refuse to be broke any day of my life. Why? I know how to budget and to live. If you budget well, it tell you should be the richest week in your life. You should not be broke. In the name of Jesus. I'm broke. Pretty soon saying straight, amen. Isn't it strange how people say I'm broke, but they've got money for cell phone? Oh, come on, we talk to this church, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm calling with guilt today. Isn't it strange how we are so broke, but we have money for whatever that's not useful? And therefore, we're going to know how to budget. We're going to know how to plan. Because what you purpose you now will open up a new era for you in the name of Jesus. Your present situation is getting us ready for a new era. God is a Jairus and is preparing you for a new era. Jesus was, making, was walking with Jairus. The atmosphere was charged with healing. The atmosphere was, was filled with heaven's glory. And Jesus was on his way. Listen to me. The present situation changed Joseph's life. The present situation changed the three boys' life. In several language, Joseph knew he could be a mighty man, and one day he could take charge. The three boys knew, come fire or hell, Jesus will raise me up in Jesus' name. I'm going to tell you today, the moment you understand your present situation, the moment you know that Jesus and the Holy Ghost is with you, the moment you understand that heaven is backing you, he will prepare you for the better and the greater new era in the name of Jesus. I can tell somebody today it's not about what you are right now it's not about the food you're not eating right now it's not about the money you don't have right now but your heart and your present situation with the Lord is going to take you higher and greater and better in the name of Jesus get ready and get a door in opening get ready and get an opportunity open. all you going to do is focus on the Lord and not on the door of opportunity somebody shout hallelujah well, Pastor, I am falling absent every day. Stop falling absent. Oh, Jesus, he will help you out. But how do I fall in? Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 3. Call on the Lord and he will answer. Somebody help me. Listen to me. Many times I tried protocol, my call dropped. And then my call dropped. Sound see, my call is done. But I got Jesus, my call is picked up. And hello, he is heaven. I'm going to tell you right now, call on the power of the Holy Ghost. How come, Pastor? The Bible says, for the power that's within you will work it out and make you greater in the name of Jesus. For he will do exceedingly, abundantly greater than you can even think of or desire in the name of Jesus. Somebody believe me. Shout hallelujah. It's time not to allow the location of your life determine the inspiration that you got. Well, I don't know. I live in a one bedroom apartment, Pastor. After I look at the guy, he's got 10 bedrooms. Hey, Jesus does not equate the number of bedrooms to the word of God in your heart. You can turn your one bedroom place with the word of God like that. Because of one word, just one word from God can change your life. Just one word from God can change your future. Just one word from God will change your destiny. Just one word from God will change your mission for glory in the name of Jesus. You move away from lack to prosperity, from failure to success, from a zero to a hero, because God is your source and not any door of opportunity. Tell me your hallelujah. God wants you to know he's ready for you. But here's the entire thing. Jairus knew that his attitude determined his altitude. Jairus knew that his present situation, he knew the season doesn't change you. You change your attitude to enjoy that season. He knew that. He knew all he had to do was be upset to Jesus. The healing of his daughter is gone. All he had to do was be upset with himself. The healing is gone. And many a time, 
our opportunities of success for the future is messed up by the attitude of our lives. We've got to guard it. We've got to protect it. Please don't be hearers at Faith Ministry. Be doers in the name of Jesus. Somebody, hallelujah. Tap your neighbor, tap your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. Walk, walk yourself, walk yourself, walk yourself. Walk yourself. That means you need to work the word so the word begins to work in your life. I said, walk the word so the word begins to walk in your life. I said, walk the word. Walk it in your home, walk it in your business, walk it in the street, walk it in your job, walk it wherever. It must operate in the name of Jesus. Oh yes, God is for you. Why? Because the word is with you in Jesus' name. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Number five. Plan now for the new future. Plan now for the new future. Some times back, there was a sister. We had two instances with her. Number one, she wanted to get married. What's happening, sister? Pastor, I'm ready for God to send me the right man. <laughs> Five years later, sister, what's up? Pastor, I'm ready for God to send me the man. But what if I grab her inside? Said, come with us. We took her down the road. See all these men. See all these men. See all these men. What men you want? Finally, she found us a man. Amen. She found us a man. She got married. Well, she got married. This is very good. If you're below 13, close your ears. Got married. Prayed for her. To her little sister, gone on honeymoon. Husband grabbed her. Took her on the honeymoon. That evening, there was a prayer meeting in one of the churches. She ran away from her honeymoon, came to the church. <laughs> she said, what's wrong? No, pastor. That man is a bad dude. All he wants to do is strip me naked. What's his problem? <laughs> Sister, you want to get married. Do you know what marriage is about? That's a problem. Plan now for your future. If you don't understand the future, then you will learn about it in the name of Jesus. Tell me some hallelujah. <laughs> Too many thoughts about the future, but you have no idea. You're going to get into business, you have no idea. You're going to get married, you have no idea. Oh, pastor, I'm looking for that hunk. Hey, that hunk, I've got a six barrel cartoon. I want my six packs, too. And all you're going to do is know your future by studying it. You can do whatever you want to. See, what I'm saying to you is, many of us want to do things, but we don't plan. We don't study about it. You cannot become a medical officer without studying. You cannot become a constable without going out there and studying and practicing it. I mean, I was so amazed and chuffed when I saw our own people in the parade of the SAPS. I said, wow, it's fantastic. They look smart, in fact, our guys were looking handsome. I thought by now you give them a hand clap, amen. amen. They were looking smart and handsome. And I love people's uniform because people's uniform serve God in this country. They serve in this country to God. And therefore, we're going to know how to honor But listen to what I'm going to say. They went out there in the plan now. They plan themselves. They waited and then after they went in. Jairus heard the same story. But he purposed to take what he had in the now of Jesus into the future. To change the future with what he had in the now. Until you know how to have God in you now. When you go to the future and you don't have God, you're going to be totally messed. You're going to work with your skills and not with the anointing. People don't ask me a question, I keep repeating this to them. What's the difference between two attorneys? They both know the law, they both know how to find the case, they both know how to debate, but here's the difference between the one that knows the Holy Ghost. It comes to the crunch of the time when the Holy Ghost will give him an insight greater than the one who does not know the Holy Ghost. Because why? Because the Bible says the Holy Ghost is not only my comforter, I'm a counselor, but the Holy Ghost is also my advocate. So he will give us wisdom of how to win that battle. And all of a sudden, the person who knows Jesus, he's lifted up higher, and all of a sudden, he brings out a point, and he wins that case. All you're going to do 
is know the Holy Ghost in the midst of your struggle. And I can tell you right now, you will be a winner in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Plan now for your future. I have we plan now for that day? Have we planned for education? Have you planned to go to university? Have you planned to have a greater amount for next year? Have you planned for the suit for Christmas? <laughs> have you planned for the turkey or the duck or whatever you buy for Christmas? You see, if you haven't planned, you're not going to have. Then you cannot sit at the table and say, well, the churches don't care about it. No, no, no. It's not the church. It's your planning. Amen. People say, well, the church must take care of the widow. You don't want me to open the scripture. If I open the scripture, you're going to be messed up. The church, the Bible never says the church must take care of the widow. The Bible says the widow must be taken by, care by her family. Amen. Only the one who does not have a family and is serving God must the church take care of. Amen. 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 Go back to scripture. Don't let people give you traditional thoughts. Hallelujah. Where was I? Number five. Number six. Number six. Stop grumbling about where you are and what you are. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, he's talking to you. Uh, she did a neighbor, he's talking to you. In life, grumbling and bitterness comes as a natural instinct. In life, failure becomes a natural instinct not to complain about. In life, Losing has been taken away, has been taken as part of life. And so what happens is we do nothing about it. Well, I'm sure that's God's will. If God's will is for you to fail, He would have allowed you to fail a long time to develop it and become better. Not we keep on failing, 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 because you do nothing but life. We've got to learn not to grumble, and we've got to learn how to guard our heart. That means that grumbling will only stagnate where you are. God is saying change is possible to all who dare to change. So as we purpose to enter a new season and new year, new era, practice to reverse our negative or positive to positive. Practice to turn around our thought of failure to become success. Packing ourselves to renew our mind daily so that we can have a better future in the name of Jesus. If you do the same thing that you did last year and failed, why do it again this year? How about doing something new to have a greater future in the name of Jesus? If you know by having the same argument with your spouse daily, how about stopping for a second and thinking, how can I change my habit in order to make our family a happier family? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Because many of us have the same habits. You crumble to your spouse every day over the same thing, and you have the same argument every day. Rather than hang on, I need to see how I can change it. In other words, I can change his habit by how I change my attitude. Amen. And the moment I change my attitude, I begin to change my vocal. And when I change my vocal, I have a better understanding to my husband or my wife in the name of Jesus. So number one, you got to guard our heart. Number two, enjoy your present until the opportunity opens the door. Number three, always know that what you enter into will be tougher than your present. Number four, our present situation is getting us ready for the new era. Number five, plan now for a new future. Number six, stop. Stop about where you are or what you are. Find it number six, number seven. When you respect your present, your future will be respected by you. The greatest challenge I have right now is to see how people disrespect each one, young or old. Respect is a two-way street. It's like a boomerang. What you let go out of your life comes back and hits you in your face. When you disrespect your spouse, you simply disrespect your tomorrow. When you disrespect your parents, you simply allow the same disrespect to come upon you. When you disrespect your teachers, they will never, they'll never be comfortable to teach you correctly. When you disrespect people out there, the same thing happens. What about waiters? How we tend to disrespect them? What about shopkeepers? 
How will they show the still helping hand and the, the shop? How we learn to disrespect them? Our life has become in South Africa the most disrespectful nation. We have become comfortable. We have become bossy to everybody. Yes, I know you got the money. Yes, I know you drive a Ferrari. Yes, I know you drive a plane. Yes, I know you're out there, but you don't have to have your nose lifted up. Simple language, be humble. And the Bible says, when you humble yourself before God, in due season, he will lift you up in the name of Jesus. Never think that you're so high that you cannot fall. Remember where you started from, right down. And God picked you up. And as God picked you up, now that you're out there, you should not be so aloof that you cannot come down. I can tell you today, it's time for us to know how to respect one another. It's time for us to know whether the elder, it's not about whether you're young, greet the person, hello, I'm so sorry, how are you? It's simple as that. This is what I've done, Pastor Ray, will you come please? Many times when you walk by, face me, when you walk by, now the opposition will walk and you'll try to juggle, and all of a sudden, walk past me, he bumps me. Now I know he bumped me, but I said, oh, I'm so sorry. What do you think I've done to him? I will make him feel guilty knowing that he bumped me, but I apologize. So easy. Did he get offended? No. Did I get offended? No. But we allow the peace of God to come just by saying, I'm so sorry. All I'm saying, family, is time for us to know how to own up and how to be respectful. The more you become respectful to anyone, find God respecting you from everyone. It is so simple as that. I discovered that in life, people want to be bossy, but here's the entire thing. Respect is a two-way street or a boomerang. It comes back and faces you head on. Begin to enjoy your present situation. Begin to respect yourself in that situation. Don't hate yourself where you are. Change it by changing how you think. Jairus was placed in a difficult situation and his daughter is dead. But Jesus said, respect the present situation you are right now. Be at peace. Don't listen to them. What was he saying? He said, when you respect your present situation, when you enter to your future, the future will respect you as well in the name of Jesus. You see, family of God, when you find excuses of you today, you'll find excuses in your tomorrow. Then you'll never respect you tomorrow because why? Everything you see will be a fault. Unless you learn to change your thinking, somebody else out there will not change the thinking for you. We've got to know how to change our thinking. Many folks want to find happiness after the past, after the past exam or get married or find a new job. No. Don't ever marry to complete yourself. Don't ever marry to find happiness. Don't ever find a job to have money. You must be satisfied within yourself and let everything else be a cherry on the top in the name of Jesus. Wherever I go, I will say these things in a very nice way, especially when I do marriage conference. I say, I'm married for 40 years. But my wife never makes me happy. And I'm bored about it. Because the day she starts making me happy, and she stops making me happy, then I will kill myself because why I have no happiness. But you see, I make myself happy, and she just adds a cherry on the top. Unless you know how to enjoy your life first, nobody else will enjoy your life for you. Amen. Amen. Jesus took the anointing that he carried today to tomorrow and changed tomorrow by what he had today. And listen, the father took Jesus home. Today, you as a mom, you are a dad, you have the Holy Ghost in you. How about taking him to the home? And when you sit at home with the Holy Ghost, know there's a presence of God. Know there's an anointing of God. Respect that present situation with him and see how your present and your future will be filled with someone of joy. Your anointing of today will change your tomorrow in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Let us stand. I'm going to challenge you today. We are walking into a great year of 2017. 2017 is symbolic of double grace. Double grace simply means as I told you a couple of weeks back, I'll be ministering that on New Year's Eve. 
There's going to be plenty of sin rising up in South Africa in particular. But the Bible says, as sin abounds, your double grace will abound even greater in the name of Jesus. In the midst of people having crisis, your double grace will lift you up if you're obedient to the word of God. If you understand about the double grace, it means the application of his word and the obedience to his voice. Today, as you close your eyes,